So welcome to our latest Quantum Marketplace, Investors in Quantum. We have a great panel today. Uh, I'm Mark Wipich. I'm the leader and moderator of the Quantum Marketplace. Okay, so what we're going to do is give a few updates on the Quantum Marketplace, and then also uh, I'll do so, a quick overview and trends of what's been going on in investments in Quantum. Then we'll get into the lineup, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion. So the quantum marketplace, what is it? it? It raises brand awareness, facilitates collaboration, deals and partnerships. The feedback has been overwhelming from presenters that they're getting new clients, new partnerships, even finding new investors. Um, so uh, we have two aspects to the quantum marketplace where you can interact uh, that are both publicly facing, um, even though QDC is a membership based organization. Uh, one is on the QDC website. You can see the link there. All the companies that uh, are you know, looking to do commercial products uh, have listings there. Uh, they have little pink icons next to their name. If they've also presented in the quantum marketplace, you can also go to YouTube uh, where all of this is uh, professionally video processed after the event and posted there for further viewing. Um, so, OK, so in terms of YouTube, uh, in terms of like this being posted, these are the companies today and, and well, entities that are, are going to be presenting. We have Incutel, Qubit Ventures, Quantascent, General Innovation Capital, and U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructure, which are all involved in some aspect of investing. Uh, and then the Quantum Insider, uh, we, you know, they are really one of the leading business intelligence platforms that focuses on quantum and some other markets, and they're going to be giving their perspective as well on that. Um, okay, so in terms of um, overview and trends, this is some recent data. Actually, uh, this is uh, Christoph Jacques from Quantination actually just published this in a white paper. Uh, he's pulling, uh, you know, various sources here. Um, and, you know, the, the right side, uh, this is all publicly available information from QRECA, who's put together uh, public funding, government funding, you know, there's a lot that's been sort of cumulative been going on. I'm not gonna dig into the details here. You can look at this later. Uh, on the left side is, is, is more from the private deal perspective. Uh, obviously what's very interesting is that 2022 was, was very healthy. 2021 was very healthy for quantum. 2023 is a little bit off, but uh, I think Alex, you're gonna go into it a little bit. Uh, in your presentation, because uh, you have the data here, and, and Christoph is actually uh, referencing your data in here, um, and then also I'm going to talk about a bit what's happened in November. Um, but uh, you know, even though venture funding in quantum is a little bit lower than it was last year, it's still pretty good uh, in terms of private, uh, and you know, versus some of the other venture markets are off a bit more than that. Um, okay. So just, I don't want to go into detail here. I'm just providing this as data, um, you know, but looking at papers that have been submitted and patents have been filed, uh, and then also number of employees that are in going into quantum and what is the number of women going into quantum, and then how is the funding breaking down in, in grants and, and equity, and et cetera. Um, another quick snapshot here of, you know, vendors. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into details right now, but this will be, you know, for people's reference in the future in terms of quantum computing, enabling technologies, sensing, telecommunications, and security. Okay, so recent private investment deals. Uh, this is very encouraging. Uh, you know, so new quantum, Entropic Labs, Quandela, Photonic, uh, you know, Oxford Quantum Circuits. Quantum diamonds, you know, this spans the spectrum from quantum networking, quite a few in quantum computing, one in quantum sensing. Uh, Photonic, actually, I just want to highlight uh, their lead investor was Microsoft. That's a big deal. That's another one of the big strategics that's getting involved and very active and publicly, you know, announcing that they were part of this round. I think that's a really big deal. If you add all these up, that's 277 million in private capital raised in the past 30 days. I, I think that's really good I and and people I'm talking I'm involved in deals myself I'm, I'm talking to other uh, investors uh, there are more deals that are most likely going to close in December so I think we're still on a healthy track here although as Celia said I think we need more um, so in terms of the presenters today I wanted to give the audience uh, sort of a, or attendees here a bit of an understanding you may not know all of them sort of where do they fit in the ecosystem and and this is my sort of version of this 
Um, so, you know, obviously stay in touch with them and to figure out exactly what they're doing. But, you know, if we talk about pre-seed and seed stage, uh, you know, private funding, Quant Descent, uh, Qubits Ventures and InQtel are all playing in that in that uh, vertical there. Uh, and then InQtel actually, you know, George, you know, you're going to go into this a bit, but you're sort of stage agnostic in terms of pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C, and then say the growth stage, right? But you don't play so much in public companies. Um, and then general innovation capital is primarily a growth fund. Uh, Mark Danchek will probably give you a little bit more subtlety there, but uh, maybe less on the pre-seed and series A side. Uh, and then advanced quantum computing infrastructure, you know, Jeffrey is gonna talk about what he does with public companies. He doesn't really do so much with private. And then Quantum Insider, Alex is gonna talk about how he provides and his team provides business intelligence across all of these areas. Okay, so in terms of the lineup today, we have George Hoyam, who's the Executive Vice President of Investments at EQTEL. We have Nardo Molinatano from Qubits Ventures. We have Martin LaForest from Quant Descent. We have Mark Danchek from General Innovation Capital. We have Jeffrey Cohen from Advanced U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructure, and we've got Alex Challenge. Alex Challenge actually runs a bigger organization, and the Quantum Insider is one of those divisions, but I'll let him go into the details there. So with that, let me switch over to, George, your presentation. Uh, let's see here. All right. So, George, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Uh, first off, I, I really appreciate the work QED does. You guys are great at thought leadership, convening and sharing. And I, I'll just point out to the group that we actually sourced one of our uh, recent investments from a QED session like this. Uh, and I'm going to also send my email via chat. So if anybody has a, a company they're working on or aware of it, that, that uh, we're very active in this area. So thank you. Next slide. Um, so in Utah, just a few minutes here on who we are, and what we do. We're an independent non-for-profit. A lot of people don't realize that. We're a 501c3, interestingly. And we're this intersection between the government, the 3,000 venture capital companies, and the 18,000 startups in, in the U.S. Uh, community. So the, the goal is pretty simple with InQtel. It's to source innovation from the startup community and guide those technologies and the problems of national intelligence. And I'll talk about the agencies we serve uh, in a moment. Next slide, please. So we are a global footprint these days. We have seven offices worldwide. We've opened up offices in Singapore, Sydney, London, Germany, uh, and um, are active around the world because we know that you know all the best technology doesn't come out of Silicon Valley these days. It comes from all different kinds of places. Uh, we're about uh, 160 people. So we make about uh, 70 investments a year. So we're a very, very active uh, investor. Our checks aren't super large, but our impact can be can be quite uh, meaningful uh, based on the various companies. Next slide, please. Uh, so the partners that we serve, we have you know uh, an agreement. Uh, our executive sponsor is the CIA. We were stood up by the CIA 20 plus years ago. Actually, next year will be our 25th anniversary. And so over the years, we've evolved to support all of these intelligence agencies. I'm not going to go through all the lists. But uh, the goal is to you know, take these uh, companies we find and then run pilots at scale against real problems. And we'll talk about the two kinds of deal sources we do. So the last place in the world a startup's gonna go is knock on the door of the CIA or NSA or something like that. So into that gap steps InQtel. And we often have transactions where we have one, two, three, sometimes six agencies. And the goal really is to pilot something at scale against a real problem and then ultimately have the company and the customer conduct business directly if the pilot is successful. Next slide. So we have two kinds of deals we do. We are stage agnostic, but the, the first deal we do is sort of a small equity only investment to get involved with the company, kind of zero to a million dollars. And we do this at very early stage. We've done napkin deals all the way up to you know, larger transactions. And the goal here is to really put a spotlight on the, on the company for our partners and to you know, uh, move that ultimately towards what we call a capabilities deal. The second kind of deal we do are these adaptation projects where we'll join a company. And when you think about it, probably early stage company, their VCs are saying, hey, the worst, last place in the world you want to go is, is to the government at this stage. So into that gap, we step and we actually structure our deals with a combination of NRE, non-recurring engineering and equity to actually help fund and shape the features that are in their commercial roadmap and guide those into a pilot. 
the pilot can be an adapted product that will work into the use case that we've envisioned. 95% of the companies we invest in have never done business with the government. And so into that gap, we step and we kind of guide people in like a rifle shot so they don't have to spin up a big federal group, et cetera. And when it works, uh, the company and the customer take that pilot and convert it into a, uh, a direct deal. Next slide. Um, so these are the technology areas we focus in. Um, I'm not going to go through the list, but we're very active in quantum. Uh, we've invested in every major quantum architecture on the compute side, D-Wave, Rigetti, IonQ, Sandbox, Universal Quantum. Um, so the reason, you know, these are these are competitive, but they're also very different approaches to the quantum problem, you know, whether you're a trapped ion or a gate model or something in the annealing area. And so we let the customers try and pilot these capabilities against various use cases. So we're very knowledgeable about that. We're seeing now kind of what I call the second wave of quantum, which is all these technologies that have been created are creating spin-off capabilities, mostly around the sensors and or enabling platform areas. And we can talk about that later, but these are the primary areas we focus on. Next slide. And that's it. Uh, I've kind of run out of time here, but we're very active and we're excited to talk to the group today and see if we can help some companies. Thank you. Great, thanks, George. Nardo. All right, hi, uh, I'm Nardo Manoloto. I'm with uh, Qubits Ventures. Uh, Qubits Ventures is a venture fund investing in pre-seed, seed stage quantum and photonics, uh, technology startups uh, solving complex challenges that creates positive so societal impact. So our investment strategy, it's really more than just quantum computing. I, I get this question a lot. Uh, do you only invest in quantum computing? No, we don't. Uh, we also invest in uh, quantum applications, quantum systems, quantum devices, transitional or bridge technologies. So when we say quantum applications, this, this could include a simulation, AI for quantum, digital twins, optimization, cryptography, uh, which means cybersecurity type companies. Uh, quantum systems, uh, system software, OSs, tools and utilities, programming platforms, data analytics, quantum networks. Uh, we do quite a bit in the quantum devices side of things, uh, sensors, chips, components, photonics devices, memory, ASICs. And then this category of what I consider transitional or bridge technology. So these, these could be a hybrid computing, quantum inspired type applications, hybrid application, uh, integration software, interconnects are, are all those areas. Uh, from a ticket size perspective, uh, we invest uh, 100 to 500K PC seed level. We invest anywhere globally, uh, except where there are some certain US restrictions that we cannot do. Uh, so that's from a thesis perspective and is what I invest in. And what I wanted to do is share with you some of the areas that uh, I am interested in seeing a lot more startups in and uh, de definitely interested in funding. Uh, because of the whole, uh, you know, the, the combination of exponential computing and AI would basically give us what we call exponential intelligence. I'm looking for uh, a lot of technologies on the AI side that's already there that's looking to use quantum computing and quantum technologies to uh, create this category of exponential intelligence. Another area that I am invest uh, I am interested in is artificial intelligence for quantum. So uh, there are a lot of uh, problems that we can solve in quantum using the current classical AI systems right now. So I, I think about companies that are uh, generating design tools uh, that's uh, basically helping quantum uh, system to be designed in a better way using AI. So I'm interested in this category of investments as well. Uh, another big interest of mine in which I've done several of my portfolios are falling within this space is what I call the integrated quantum photonics. So this is really, uh, you know, the, the use of quantum photonics is really that science of generating, manipulating and detecting light uh, for controlling light field or photons, right? So you could take a look at this and generate applications of integrated quantum photonics in quantum technologies, like in quantum computing, quantum communications, quantum simulations, and quantum metrology. And then, you know, as part of uh, me looking at the database that all the things that I've captured of all companies that have 
pitch to me, I've seen a lot of companies starting to get into advanced and new materials. So in order for us to get to the next generation of quantum technologies and quantum computing, we also need to make sure that there are advancement in the advanced and new materials area. This includes things like diamonds with nitrogen vacancy defects, novel crystals, molecular materials, uh, ultra thin materials, and uh, things like that. And lastly, uh, I, I definitely am very interested in the intersection of quantum and biology and healthcare. So basically quantum biology is that study of the quantum phenomena and principle like entanglement and superposition in biological processes and systems. For example, uh, photosynthesis is actually uh, a, a quantum bio, it's a quantum biological process. Uh, another one is your nose, your, your smelling, your smelling process. So that's also a quantum biological process. I'm interested in seeing how those kinds of technologies, um, uh, the te technology could be applied uh, to, be to better our society. And that's it. If you need to contact me, I'm at nardo at qubitsventures.com. Thank you. Thank you, Nardo. Uh, Martin. So as a bit of a follow up to Nardo, we are our, our funds are you know a, a bit along along the same way, but uh, but different enough that, uh, that we can work well together. So I'm a managing partner of a new fund called Quantaset, and how new it is? Well, it was officially announced last Friday, so it's very new. But we've been uh, you know be making due diligence and looking at deals for about the, the last six months now. So we are. We, we are starting to be active and we should uh, announce our, our, our first investment within a, a few weeks or, or a month or so. So our thesis is we're a $24 million fund. Uh, we are based in Sherbrooke, but we can uh, invest globally. Uh, we, and we invest in pre-seed and seed. Uh, and it's an exclusive to quantum uh, quantum technology. And I think maybe something that makes Quantaset a little bit uh, unique is that we are anchored within a uh, fairly strong and growing ecosystem, the one in, in Sherbrooke, Quebec, which I invite you to uh, come check out a little bit what's going on there. There's a lot of activity, lots of momentum. But although we're anchored there, we're not exclusive to Sherbrooke. So we're looking at deals outside of the province of Quebec, in Canada, and in the United States, uh, in the world. Um, so we're open to everything. So the team is comprised of uh, experts in investment. So I have my partner, Ghislaine, who's been, uh, that's actually his third fund. He's been very active and present in the deep tech investment uh, here in Quebec. And uh, myself and my colleague, Chloe Archambault, we're both from a technical background. So we're both, uh, uh, we grew up with quantum uh, around us. And then we've done the academic route. We've done the industry route. So both of us have worked in, uh, in quantum startups. And then now we're uh, we're entering in the um, in the investment world. And I think one of the one of the positive that we bring in is that not only we understand the financing role, but we also have quite a good grasp on the technology itself. So we can support the companies as well as uh, on their technology and and connecting with global players that might be end users or potential uh, technological partner. So we invest uh, in pretty much anything quantum, but here we focus on quantum, what I would call 2.0. Okay. So the new generation of quantum technology that takes care, you know, that use quantum superposition, entanglement, uh, uh, interference. But we also, uh, in, we also invest in enabling technology. So the whole supply chain. So as long as a, as a company has a, a bit of a focus on building the technology that help other quantum companies build their, their technology. We're interested by it. It's a strategic play for us. And also I should mention that we're not the kind of fund that believes that quantum is the answer to everything. So we don't believe in the quantum is the answer. What is the question? Uh, we believe that quantum you know, is not the answer to everything, but can have some very specific solution to specific problem. And this is where we wanna focus uh, our approach. So I mentioned that we're anchored in an ecosystem. So the ecosystem is based in the province of Quebec, just uh, uh, maybe 150 kilometers east of Montreal. And why Quebec is, well, it, I think it's a fairly well-known fact that Canada has been heavily investing in quantum computing and quantum technology research for the past 15 years to the tune of upward of $3 billion in public and private fund. And Quebec as a province, they pile on top of this by uh, launching a $400 million strategic innovation zone approach uh, about a year ago. And Quantaset is sort of a, 
the investment corner store, uh, cornerstone of, uh, uh, of this ecosystem. So just to show you, uh, we're not a, a player alone in our corner waiting for deals. We're part of a, a bigger team of players that are either local, provincial, or even international. So we work with several uh, academic institution. We deal with other ecosystem around the world, co-investors. Uh, we also are, work very closely with incubators, local and international. And just to give you maybe an example of how we operate of how or how Quantaset is planning to take advantage of the whole ecosystem is if I take just for as an example, the local ecosystem here in Sherbrooke, we have ensured to put in place all the pieces necessary to create a nice, strong, diversified and robust pipeline for the fund, which start with academic research, uh, which is very strong in the University of Sherbrooke. We just announced at the same time as Quantaset, a venture studio whose role is to help create quantum companies out of very strong uh, int um, intellectual properties. Lasset, which is a deep tech incubator, is currently building a specific track for quantum uh, companies. We're currently supporting nine quantum companies uh, from Quebec, but also uh, outside of the province. Uh, so we have, I think, three companies outside of the province and the rest is from Quebec. And we are all part of this innovation zone, which is uh, this ecosystem that we're building with a strong focus on, uh, on you know, tr transformation from ideas to technology. So on this, I'll, uh, you know, thank you. And if you want to have more details on us or more, please feel free to, uh, to contact us. Great. Thanks, Martin. Mark Danchek. Great. Thank you. And I'll also share my, in the chat, my email. Um, Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, look, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, uh, my email is there. I also just shared it in the chat. I'm from General Innovation Capital. Um, we uh, have been and I've been one of the, the founding members firms of QEDC. I, we're a huge believer in the mission. Um, and we do believe that, you know, I'm sure like everyone on this call, that these next five years are incredibly important and that, you um, Getting together in, in opportunities like this that that Mark and Celia and team are coordinating is is a great way to exchange information and, and try to understand more. And so, our focus is is we're we're a deep tech fund. Um, you know what where where quantum falls for us is is next generation compute and advanced sensing and communications. But we do a number of other things. Um, we are uh, so I've been an investor in the quantum space since 2015. Um, done a lot of early stage investments. Our focus is today is on growth stage. So we are sort of the next step uh, in funding for companies after they've gone beyond the sort of seed and maybe early A stage. We think there's an opportunity there. We think there's a need there for companies as they scale up. Um, we tend to track our companies for years before we make investments. Um, and so that says, we like to get to know the companies. We like to get to hear what, what you're working on, what your goal is, who you've recruited, what the, the next steps you're going after are, and track where you are to those things. And then for the companies that, that um, continue to, to move and innovate and do things, um, those are very, very attractive partners uh, for us and opportunities. We do focus on hard engineering. Um, as you all know, quantum is hard. It's difficult. It takes capital. It takes time. Um, and But at the stage we're looking to invest, we're really not looking for science problems. We're looking for hard engineering problems. And, and we, when we get invested in companies, there's a clear technical roadmap to grow, to be um, there's revenue base of some sort. There's customer engagement. Um, we know a lot of customers in the space, which which helps sort of us vector in on interesting companies. Um, and really, that's our focus. And we think this is an incredibly important time uh, in the space and that uh, that we love to participate with anyone who's on this call who, who sort of meets the, that criteria. Great, thanks, Mark. Okay, Jeffrey. Can you see it? Yep. Great. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Cohen. 
I want to thank you very much for um, inviting us to present. I'm the investment advisor principal and president of U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructures Incorporated. We were founded in 2010, and we are registered investment advisors with a focus on quantum computing. We're also founding members of the QEDC. So we do three things, and they all have quantum aspects. We provide investment advice for clients, and we do it through a quantitative model that we develop, maintain, and run on an in-house platform. We can also run this platform on quantum computers. It was designed with a quantum algorithm, so it's a little different than, let's say, what a Goldman might do or a UBS. So it looks at the entire U.S. equity market, all 3,000-plus stocks, loads them into a matrix, and figures out the best portfolios and the worst portfolios that you can invest in. It's, it's totally amazing. We run it every day. It's so much fun. Uh, we provide consulting and project services around information technology. We've done some pretty interesting work specifically in the quantum space as well. And we provide non-discretionary investment advice. We've, we're building an expertise in publicly traded quantum firms and the quantum portion of publicly traded firms. Our solutions and services around the Chicago quantum net score we have separately managed accounts. We work with Charles Schwab as our custodian. Uh, what this does, it provides protection to investors so that Charles Schwab is, is managing the actual money and then we provide the trades. And then we provide US equity market analysis on both a long and a short basis on a daily basis. We also provide fee-based investment advisory services. We'll do quantum consulting projects and we have other areas of expertise if you're interested you know, give us a call. So our focus and where we've decided to use quantum is in financial services. So the use of a quantum algorithm to pick better stock portfolios and performing portfolio optimization of 3,000 or more U.S. listed stocks. Why is this hard? Because you're looking at 3,000 stocks and you're looking at all the possible permutations to build a portfolio. And that's a very large search space. From a quantum and IT perspective, it's discussing the IT marketplace, the quantum ecosystem. That's fun for us. We like it. We're doing fundamental investment analysis of companies. Specifically, we do a lot of quantum companies, publicly available information only. And it's amazing from a potential investor perspective, the story that you can tell around the stocks of quantum companies. And we will support unique requests as well. I mean, we, we did have our uh, two-year coding project for a quantum computing um, research project. So our goal, why we're here today, not only just to answer questions, but to help institutions and accredited individuals, also known as high net worth individuals, to invest better, smarter. So I have a call to action. Try our Chicago quantum net score model. So what we did to make it easy for everyone is I've created a coupon code for the QEDC members, for participants of this conference, and anyone who watches the video between now and the end of the year, it's 90% off. So there's really no reason not to try it. You could try it as many times as you want. Um, it's once a day. And uh, thank you so much for participating. Best way to reach us is through email, or actually the phone phone number is, uh, is my direct number. We are in Highland Park. We're registered as well with federal government. We have a gauge code if you're DOD, and we're registered with FINRA, SEC, and the Illinois Department of Securities. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, Alex Challens, tell us about the current state of the business intelligence of what's going on in quantum. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you all for taking the time to listen today and for everyone else who's contributed uh, so far. Um, I'll just get this up on screen and let's get cracking. So presentation um, mode. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Perfect. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm the CEO of Resonance, which owns uh, the Quantum Insider. Uh, Resonance operates brands across uh, five different deep tech verticals with quantum being our flagship. 
We provide media and market intelligence to hundreds of customers across uh, the landscape. And we're now a team of about 40 people, venture backed, and we're growing rapidly. Um, I'm going to focus on our market intelligence support and then give a couple of minutes at the end on what are we, what are we seeing in the market. So our intelligence platform, we collect uh, data on everything going on in the quantum market and we put it in this SaaS platform where you can look at anything that's going on and dig into it in more detail. It serves investors, startups, corporations, governments, and it provides a holistic overview of the market. We don't just provide funding round information. We're really building these very rich ecosystem maps. So you can dig into who are the key partners, government relationships, and everything else in between. We get our data from over 100,000 sources of news, and then we convert this into structured intelligence in the same way that is typically done across the defense in industry and open source intelligence, OSINT. Um, and we do we we make sure the data is correct with a mixture of running it through the large language models to process this enormous amount of information, and then we have our own analysts in house who will go and classify this information and structure it. We cover an enormous amount of data, as you can see here. I'm not going to go through this, but typical use cases around competitive intelligence, due diligence, uh, government doing ecosystem mapping, and indeed for investors doing opportunity scouting. A couple of customer case studies, we've worked with the British government around the 2.5 billion pound national strategy, and we provide subscription access to the British government and several other uh, national governments and agencies. Indeed, we also work with commercial organizations like uh, large consultants, making sure that the advice that they give their clients is underpinned by foundational market intelligence. So that's a little bit about us, and I'm just gonna quickly give some insight. So Mark has already kindly uh, shared a couple of these and he's updated his data more than I have. So I had to quickly chuck in the Oxford quantum circuits around here at the last minute. As Mark alluded to, the, the funding has dried up a little bit in 2023, but there's some nuance to that. 2021 and 2022 were pretty special years, lots of SPACs, lots of um, very large Series Bs. And I'll kind of provide a little bit of perspective on that as well. Quantum is still a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of investment in the global VC market. And indeed, the overall market has declined for VC over the last year as well. I think the total market here is 53% down. I think quantum's about 40% down. So any discussions around a quantum winter, I'll be picking up at Q2B. Um, and I'll say that it, I don't think we are in a quantum winter. And just a final point I'd like to uh, frame for the discussion later is that we shouldn't forget that private capital is only one part of the ingredients around how we build a successful quantum ecosystem. Private capital as its peak was 2 billion. Government funding absolutely dwarfs this. And we often forget about public companies as Jeffrey was alluding to. And we also forget about the big tech companies like AWS, Google, Microsoft, who are putting an enormous amount of money that not everyone knows about in their R&D in quantum. So that's a very short uh, overview. I'd be delighted to speak to anyone who's interested. You can visit our site here um, through this QR code. And I just want to say thank you for everyone in this community to help build what is a very exciting industry. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. All right, fantastic presentations. Okay, let's go into the panel discussion. I'm gonna start off with Martin and one of our prep calls. Uh, we were chatting about this. You know, do you need to have a bigger picture in mind when you invest in quantum in terms of where this is all going and why this is an opportunity? Traditional VC, a little bit different. How do you look at this? Well, yeah, I think you need a, a bigger picture because I, I kind of alluded to it into uh, you know, my short introduction that, you know, if you're looking for pure quantum plays, I think there's a large chance that you miss a boat for Simple reason that the classical computing and classical technology hasn't given up yet. There's still tons and tons of advance, and I'm still I, I'm still fairly confident that some of the first quantum advantage application we'll find might not last long because we'll find a, a way using traditional technology. So you definitely need to look past the uh, you know the short term advantage, um, and I also think that. Let, let, let's not kid ourselves, right? And probably in 10 years from now on, the idea of a, a, a quantum-only venture money is not going to exist anymore. Just like we don't have 
venture capital firms that says, I only invest in digital technology. Like quantum will yeah. become one of the tools that we use among, you know, to have, to have a, an, an impact on, you know, economic development, uh, either on, on environment or on, on IT. Or so it will become more and more towards the different verticals. So I think we need to keep that in mind as, uh, you know, for example, in my case, where we currently focus on quantum technologies, which is a niche technology with, a, with an extremely broad application. So um, that's why when I, I describe our fund, I was not mentioning necessarily for we're looking into specific verticals because the verticals are so varied that we prefer to look into the te- how a technology can affect a vertical and then look at the effect it can have as uh, you know in a wider sense of that vertical and not just from a quantum technology lens. Great, great, thank you. Um, let's go to Mark Danchek, right? So you're primarily growth stage, but you do other stages. Why is a growth stage investor interested in quantum? Well, because- or Why are you interested in quantum? Let, yeah. Let's say that. Yeah. So, uh, I think the, the um, you know, we're looking for great companies who have large upside in very big markets. Quantum and fits yeah. that bill to a T, right? So, you know, I think from that perspective, um, there is a lot of interesting things. I think back to the question you previously asked, I think having history is really important in this space. I think there, there are no heuristics. There's no sort of, you know, this isn't fintech, this isn't, you know, consumer, it's not the number of eyeballs or consumers you have or the stickiness you have. This is really hard stuff. And understanding what has worked in the past, what is working now, where does the future go to? um, What are those engineering challenges? What are the substrates? What are the different sort of things that people have run into? And that broad historical perspective allows you to... um, you know, be able to to see where where things are going. I think a little bit better. So, so I think um, the opportunity set is enormous. The winners will be big winners. I think there'll be multiple winners in this space, um, and we love to engage with those companies. Yeah, great, thanks, Mark. Now going back to Nardo, you're a seed investor like Martin. Um, why are you in this space? Yeah, I think on on, on my end, uh, you, you know, if you in in order for the quantum ecosystem to thrive, uh, you really have to look at all of the different funding stages, right? So I, I like the slide that you put out there, Mark, where you positioned each one of us in which area, right? <laughs> and the big oh, yeah, I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right. Yeah. You got it right. The 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 big gaping hole right there is Series A, right? Series A, and, and I, maybe because we're not all represented here. But if you take a look at uh, what's happening in a lot of universities and research organizations, there's a lot of innovation. You know, I, I try to do a post every day on LinkedIn of all the innovation yeah. I get to find. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, right. And, and basically what's happening is like there, there isn't a day that I don't find an, a new innovation happening in, in our space. And so I said, okay, well, maybe the best bet is really, you know, we have to build this entire tech stack anyway. And to do that is we need to make sure that we have some funding uh, specifically for pre-seed and seed level, those coming out of universities, out of research organization to start to get them going. Uh, although not included grants are, are, are included in there, um, I think having an institutional approach to it uh, in, a, in a market that could grow, especially here in the U.S., uh, since I invest globally, uh, I think it helps them out. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, George. So you're doing seed, series A, B, C, and growth, uh, not public. What is EQTEL doing in terms of quantum and why? Um, Well, clearly, you know, I think we all know now that quantum works. I mean, there's no question that the technology uh, is viable. The question is, when are we going to hit quantum supremacy? Meaning a problem that can be solved on a quantum architecture that can't be solved through a classical construct. And we believe that we're approaching that in several domains. And, you know, while quantum is not a general purpose computer, it it is specialized towards certain problem sets, you know, optimization, security, et cetera. And so we're quite convinced that there'll be some black swan breakouts. And, you you know, as as an early stage investor, 
or even a later stage investor, you can't afford to not be at the table when one of these things breaks out because it's going to change the game. It'll be a little bit of a watershed event in, in our opinion. On top of it, you know, as we, you know, the computing architectures are, you know, moving forward. I don't think there's there's four or five techniques that people are, you know, working on. And there's a global competition for, you know, the right product that's going to break out here. And there's, there's a, you know, the reason we're in, there's a lot of national security use cases in, in this technology. But the spinoff technologies that are resulting from this, whether it be sensors, GPS technologies, measurement technologies, uh, are really amazing, security, et cetera. So I think as an early stage investor, you can't afford not to be involved in this category because when it breaks out, everybody will look back and say, oh, you know, that was so obvious. But unless you're at the table, you're not going to benefit from the fruits of uh, these innovations. Right. Thanks. All right, Jeffrey. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so where do you see, you know, why are you investing in quantum? Why do you see this as an opportunity? I realize you're in the later stage of the game, but why are you doing it? So it's interesting. The, um, the typical quantum computing firm started off with a valuation of around a billion dollars and has dropped 90%. Some of them have dropped more than 90%. There are a few that have kind of held their own and are only down 50%. So why invest in quantum computing? Because the market is... You're, you're talking about the, the, the public ones, right? Not the private the, ones. Correct. The public companies. Yeah, yeah right. So, so what that means for someone like us is that the market is valuing quantum companies that by law have to have great transparency, financial statements and all of that right. in a very fair way. So. You could try to search for that quantum startup. I, I got to tell you, I've had lots of emails from friends. Oh, I'm raising money. I need money. I need help, whatever. You don't know how to value them. But in the market every day, you see you could buy a whole quantum company for 100 million bucks. And they've got computers and people and staff and marketing. Yeah. I'll take it. So that's the thinking. And that if you can be a little knowledgeable about where that innovation is, is going. So as an example, there's one firm, replaced their whole leadership team, cut their costs 50, 60%, but still good core technology. You know, that might be worth a million bucks invested to make 5 million in profit. Yeah. So, so that's the thinking. And there's almost no friction through like private equity or, or discoveries. So what I would say is it's hard to invest in large companies that have small quantum quantum pieces. And uh, it's, it's easier to, to invest in small. Just one more point, Mark, it's important for those that have a little bit of a finance background. Quantum is a future. And so you have to be ready to wait. And so when interest rates were zero, it was easy to wait because it didn't cost you anything. <laughs> with, with interest rates now at 10, 20, 30 percent for some people, it's hard to wait. And so what I would say is if you're looking to invest, do it now when things are down 90, 99 percent, as long as you do your due diligence and your homework to know that it's it's a good firm to invest in. Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, Alex, you talk to a lot of investors all the time. You have, you know, your database, you're seeing a lot of stuff, you're pulled into a lot of deals. What's going on here? Why are investors, you know, looking at, you know, basically, why are they looking at quantum and not all of them, but the ones that are the serious ones, why are they looking at quantum as an opportunity? Perfect time. I've got a leaf blower in the background, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, we, um, we don't hear the leaf blower at the moment, so go ahead. Excellent. Uh, well, why invest in quantum? Well, the investment so investment thesis is you've got a massive wall of government money uh, of 40, 50 billion, um, and we've only had a couple of billion of dollars in investment going in every year. Um, yep. And I think Typically well, not including the strategics, right? Like AWS and IBM and Bosch and BMW and BSF. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so there's this massive 
impetus to grow this market backed by government. And typically when we see that, we see something that's going to be worthwhile. It may be five and maybe 10 years. So I think it's certainly interesting. I think the other point I'd like to make, you know, I'm, I'm previously a private equity investor, right? I didn't like to take risks, but you can actually do that in the quantum market. There are very interesting areas across the supply chain uh, where you can make some pretty compelling investments. So I know Nardo will be looking into uh, photonics, for example. You know, they're right. literally making money from selling lasers, fridges, etc. So I think that's interesting. And then finally, and it kind of goes to exactly what Mark is building, right? Which is we have matured in the stage. So a lot of the investors made their early bets and they'll wait to see what happens, see which qubit modalities play out, see what works. Yeah. And there are now, there's now a uh, weight of capital that is starting to be important. You need a significant amount of money to go back past Series B, past Series C. So growth equity, I think it's fantastic we're seeing this. It shows a sign of maturity in the market that we need to really back our winners and then go build it out. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. Okay, so... Just a little bit more here in this in this in this arena. What are the risks, you know, in in terms of investing in quantum now? You know, it's it, you know, look, we see, you know, there's terms of a quantum like you just talked about it, Alex. I, I hinted at it a little bit. There is a current VC winter in some segments. Um, however, with generative AI, that's getting a lot of you know water watershed funding um, and new focus. But overall, VC funding is down. But then quantum is is still is still tracking a bit. So what is the risk and opportunity getting in now versus waiting? Alex, I'm gonna go right back to you on this. So look, I think we need to get back to a realization that venture capital is about taking risks. This is about taking risks. I think I need to say it again. So I think we we should we should understand that if you go back to where venture capital came from the 1970s out of companies like Lockheed Martin subcontracting, right? Um, that was an industry where we're trying to build literal chips that we haven't thought of before. This is exactly what we're trying to do in quantum right now is build genuinely disrupted, interesting technology. So we should be confident about that. Just because the last 10 years we've been investing in enterprise SaaS and getting 100% ARR growth and brilliant cash flow. I think we need to get back to this area of understanding that there are real risks, but that's an also opportunity for enormous returns if we can be the first in these industries. Yeah, Mark, fantastic. Can I, Mark, can I add one thing? I to was that? gonna ask you next. I was gonna ask you next, right. Mark. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> I figured Mark's this was exactly thinking, in your sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I I I I think the so we're not early stage investors, um, but right. I, I will say, just sort of dovetailing on the question you asked, why now? There is an element. So I, I do think there's a first mover advantage. I think some of the bigger folks who have who have done a lot of work and have built large teams and, and so forth have their advantages today. But I also think on the earlier stages, there there is a second mover advantage. There are people who worked at different, you know, quantum computing companies or sensing companies who said... I don't agree with the way we're building this. I actually think the right way to build it is this. That was my PhD, and I'm leaving to go do that now. Yep, um, yep, so yep. there's a there's a set of learnings that that have happened since I, I would say pretty much from 2012 forward, whether at academic institutions or hyperscalers or other startups that um, are inuring to better understanding of where that next step is going to be. And so I, I do think that there are, um, I think there are a wave of, of, of companies that are potentially about to be birthed or are already birthed um, that are, are going to do very interesting things. I think on the algorithmic side of, of this, I think the world has kind of shifted towards, you know, you need to be focused on, on fully error corrected systems to, to, to run real algorithms and focus on you know resource reductions of, of of the algorithms themselves and novel ways to do that and that you know these next five years we'll see a number of companies uh, uh, in that particular area sensing and communications are i actually think at a very ripe spot right now i think there's been a lot of work done um starting in darpa and and, and moving into to other areas that that i think you could see a lot of things now again 
we're not focused on the early stage, but I think that, you know, we're going to, the benefit to us is that there's a bunch of things that the, a lot of people on this call are investing in. They're taking advantage of the lessons that have been learned over the last, you know, five to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, George. Yes, sir. So, so how are you seeing the risks and opportunity? Why quantum now, you know, in terms of like, you know, I'm sure you're also investing in AI and things like that, but why are you still investing in quantum now? Well, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, that we have to put in context is a lot of these quantum companies spac and we know that SPACs didn't work for the most part. And so a lot of them got trapped into that construct. And so I think that's a weird remnant of that wave we went through. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they no, no company should be going public, in my opinion, without any revenues. <laughs> it's a bad idea. So the, the time horizon on this stuff is long and it has to be patient capital. And there were a lot of, uh, you know, we always say that like right now in the current cycle, we're in a correction where the tourists have gone home. So a lot of the late stage hot money um, that came into this market uh, has sort of exited. So we're back to fundamentals of like building, you know, these are really, really hard technology hard tech problems and it needs patient capital and you need to grow these things slowly and hit proof points and milestones. So I think a lot of these efforts were two, three, four, five year horizons and VCs generally, you know, don't want to back something that doesn't ship a product within 18 months. And so it just comes back to investment fundamentals, but the breakout opportunities for a black swan in this area remains acute. And so, you know, smart capital is in these deals. They'll stay in these deals you know, I think Jeffrey's point about the public company <coughs> SPAC, that you're right. Like these guys spac and they're they're trading at a fraction of their capital in. Yeah, that's uh take advantage of that carnage and like invest in that area as long as you back the company correctly for a public construct. So the opportunity continues to be acute. The, 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 you know, it's a long horizon. So people just need to be patient, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, George. Uh Nardo. Yeah, I think, you know, if you take a look at the existing environment now, right, so I think uh, the Eureka slides uh, in terms of how many countries are into it are, is really a big, uh, there's really a big uh, following from, uh, from, uh, from that standpoint, right? But we have other things, right? So look at the funding opportunities in the CHIPS Act, the, the Cybersecurity Act, and all of that. And eventually, that's going to create uh, massive industries in itself, right? I think some of the other things are, you know, the areas of acquisition is also uh, normally in an early ecosystem acquisition targets. There's going to be a lot of acquisition and consolidation of uh, companies, um, companies who will get acquired by big tech companies. And it's an, it, that's an ever going cycle, right? Uh, and if you take a look at where we're at from a classical compute standpoint, where quantum sits now, it's really more on the hybrid side of things. And, and so there's a transitional effect that we need to go through in order for us to, uh, in order for us to uh, actually really uh, understand the industry and understand the impact of quantum. So I am definitely willing to wait that out because uh, the more we get better at that, uh, the more we get better at that, I can tell you the, the opportunities there are gonna be massive. But there are definitely some areas that, uh, if you take a look at the quantum tech stack, are not going to be unicorn, decacorn type companies, right? So, you know, uh, a company building wires or cabling and things like that are, are still needed to get funded, but funded in a different way. Uh, they're still important as part of the ecosystem. But what we're trying to do is learn from, you know, uh, what we currently do now, transition uh, from, you know, classical to hybrid to quantum, and then also determine what other new categories of applications and uh, um, and implementations of quantum we could we could learn, because I don't think we've learned all of the different uh, use cases for quantum yet. I, I think we're just scratching the surface at this point. So that to me is the most exciting part. Oh yeah, great, great. And and Martin, how, how did you know you and Nardo are sort of in the same area, a little different, but how do you see that? Well, well it's hard to find something to say after six people <laughs> commented on the same question. But, <laughs> wait, wait, uh, Jeffrey after... hasn't said anything yet, but that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I found a couple of things that hasn't been addressed. Uh, well, first of all, you know, I, I just want to make a, a quick comment on on the spec thing. I mean, you could see that a mile away that it will not work. I mean, you know, the, the typical the typical VC investors barely understand the dynamic of the quantum market. 
how, how do you expect the public market to understand that? I mean, we, we've seen it with, with INQ, which I- 100%. Per <laughs> right? I, I personally think INQ is a very legit company, very solid, but like they went downhill after their first uh, their their first statement just because people did not understand how a $2 billion company can have less than $1 million in revenue. But right, the point is not there. But I guess the, the, the one opportunity that I would like to talk about, and it's been mentioned a few times, but it's always in passing. And, and I mentioned that in, in several panels, like currently we are, the, the discourse about investing is completely overtaken by quantum computing. Okay, w which, is, which is great. Well, quantum computing has wonderful promises. It's a long-term, very expensive endeavor to get to. You know, the people that get to a full fault tolerant quantum computer probably have a trillion dollar business overnight. But the reality is that, that yeah. I don't know, just looking at this, that might be end up being 20, 25% of the quantum market in the, uh, in the not so deep future. Like quantum sensors are, I mean, they're so often ignored that if you look at the list of all the quantum companies, most of the quantum sensors are not even there because they're not considered quantum enough. Uh, and the beauty with quantum sensors is we already do the market. Sensors already use. The use case are known. Um, so I think there's a, an opportunity there that is under tap because maybe it's not as sexy of a story, but for a VC, there's a lot of opportunity there. And they are not as risky, not as long-term and as return. I understand that. But when you're talking about diversifying, I think there's a great opportunity there. And I think Nardo hit it on the nail by saying, let's be truly honest. Right now, tomorrow, somebody says, I have a 5,000 fault tolerant qubit computer. I'm not entirely sure if we really know what to do with it. Right? There's the, there's the old joke that says there's more book being written about quantum algorithms than quantum algorithms themselves. So, I mean, there are some well identified use cases, absolutely. But you know, we still need to make sure that we fully, fully understand uh, what a quantum computer is good for. And we're not there yet. So thank God it's a, it's a long-term play. There's yeah. lots of things that still need to be figured out. Uh, but I, I keep on with the message that it's not the only quantum play. We need to be careful by just putting all our eggs in the same basket. Right, right. Thank you. Jeffrey, anything to add? I, if I remember, the original question was the risks of investing in quantum. So I'll just, I like to give, just give a quick story, right? IBM mainframes versus Unisys and Sperry <laughs> and digital. And I'm old enough to remember things like the AS400, right? So it's not enough to come up with 5,000 qubits. It's not enough to have an operating system, a database structure, a network, but then you have to have the marketing engine to win against all the competitors that will suddenly pop up that also have 5,000 qubits. Because once somebody does it, tons of people are going to do it because intellectual property tends to float around between firms. So what I would say is this. Keep your eye on what's popular as well as what's technically savvy. And that's the biggest risk in quantum, but also the biggest opportunity because it allows for some wiggle room. Uh, so um, it, we looked at like the private equity venture cap world and the quality of the team is super important because you need to find a group of people who can win in the marketplace, not just in the science lab. Yep, totally agree. Great, thank you. Okay, so, you know, what areas are you most focused on today? I wanna to start with, I mean, Nardo, I know you're you're looking at mostly everything you're saying in quantum, uh, but also, you know, the photonic pieces, but of the four, the way that, that we're defining it here, quantum computing, quantum networking, sensing, and timing, not all quantum computing as some of the things like Martin had said. What areas are you focused on and why? 
Yeah, so uh, definitely there's a lot more hardware and chips area in the chips area, um, hardware uh, pieces that I've invested in. Uh, on the software side, uh, I still struggle to find the advantage of the software, uh, to be perfectly honest there. Um, uh, so a majority of my investment to date are you know, in the integrated, integrated quantum photonic space. So these are like picks uh, that have an EIC that can, you know, that uh, integrated, uh, that could be used for, uh, you know, for solving many different areas, including quantum. So, uh, so far, uh, the majority of my investments are, are there mainly because uh, it, it's, it, it fits within the transitional approach of how the market is going, right? So in order for something to be useful, you have to make sure that it's used. <laughs> it's used by the industry. Uh, if you invest on something that, you know, yes, uh, you could, you know, one of them, uh, one of my investment is a quantum computing uh, computer company. However, uh, the way I look at them is from a diff from a roadmap perspective, what do what can they deliver in the short term? What can they deliver in the midterm and the long term, right? Because I, I have to work with the transitional state of where the industry is at. Uh, from an investor perspective, uh, if we don't do that, then we basically miss out on uh, the earlier returns, uh, the earlier the, the earlier markups and the valuation increases of these companies. So, so far, the majority is in the uh, integrated quantum photonics uh, area. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, Martin. Oh, sorry. Uh, same question. Yes. Everybody's getting the same question. This is important. What segment are you? And part of this is I got another question coming up here, but part of this yeah. is when you're a startup CEO, when I talk to a lot of startup CEOs, they're like, well, that 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 investor or that fund, are they investing in sensing? Or are they just investing in computing? Are they investing in networking? Or are they just investing in sensing? Right. So yeah. I know you talked a little bit about it in your presentation, but just specifically, what are you mostly focused on? Well, th yeah, that, that's that's a hard question still because we're focused on everything uh, because we, we, we truly believe. And what I mean by this is that like we're a 100 percent quantum fund. We are exclusive to quantum based technology. Right. So you only invest in quantum companies or companies only in quantum company. companies. So we need to diversify within the quantum. So necessarily we cannot put yeah. all our yeah. eggs in computing or, or in communication. So <laughs> we see sensor communication computing even hardware and software and the supply chain as all having their different variant of risk level and return level so uh it's sort of if you look at my second slide that i show right so so sensors are less risky maybe less return computing long term high risk high reward so we need to look into this within those well, you know, we look at, uh, again, different uh, different type of time frames. Some software-based or application-based uh, companies might be more in the short-term NIST-type application. Some of them might be more uh, medium-term with uh, hair handling type of applications. Uh, so it, it, it's hard to tell. But something is sure is that we want to invest in what's going to help the quantum industry move forward as well as the quantum industry deployed into the marketplace. So there's a balance of those two. Okay, okay great. Um, let's see, uh, George. Okay, <clears throat> so I think the computing wave has kind of sailed, uh, meaning that quantum computing, there's things in motion and I haven't seen a new architecture in a couple of years. So that, that wave is sort of, on its way and behind us. What we're focused on, we're seeing things in, uh, people have talked about quantum networking and to enable quantum networking, you need quantum memory because you take, we've all seen that they've, we've demonstrated entangled qubits being transferred across fiber optic links. And once an entangled qubit, it's, it's unbreakable by everybody, by every measure <clears throat> with QKD being, you know, a, a partial solution to that. But you know, if you really want to protect networks against quantum breakage, you need a fully entangled qubit. So in order for that to be replicated across multiple network threads, you need to store it. And so network memory for qubits is a key area we're focused on. That enables, there was a question in the chat about repeaters. Has repeaters, have a, has a repeater been created today? Well, repeater requires quantum memory because you have to take the entangled state and replicate it. So uh, I think that's coming and there's a lot of heat being put in this area. There's a lot of investments around the world. So that's something we're focused on. 
inertial sensing. We've seen quantum being used for, you know, doing inertial sensing technologies that are quite, you know, like think of dead reckoning with, uh, you know, GPS in, in the good old days of, uh, um, you know, where Lockheed and, and L3 and people do that sort of things. And then we've also seen gravitomics where people can use quantum sensors to look into gravity fluctuations and waves around the world. What's that used for? Well, you could discover minerals in, in the earth and things of that nature. Um, and then the other thing we're focused on is the sort of picks and shovels around the area, you know, whether it be cryogenics, you know, to keep these things cold, could be someone mentioned earlier cables, the cabling in a cryogenic environment to get tech, to get signals in and out of a cryogenic environment is non-trivial when you have temperature that goes from, you know, five Kelvin to, you know, room temperature over 50 feet, you know, a lot of noise gets created. So filters and cables and things of that nature are enabling all of this stuff to happen together. Um, so those are the areas that, that, that we're sort of focused on broadly. Um, so I'll kind of pause there. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Mark Danchak. So given our stage that we're looking at, I, I think it's easiest to sum up, we're looking for real things. Right. That that's 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 the real focus of what what we're looking to do. And and sort of just similar to what George was saying, you know, if, if you're looking at sensing or communications, you want to be looking for breakthroughs in, in memory and repeaters and, and, and who has the ability to test those things, who has the team to deploy them? Are they being run at telecom wavelengths? Like, you know, it so I, I you know, on the on the competing side of things, you know, um, there's a number of companies looking to do things there on that side. It's it's how do you get to a large scale system, and, and can you prove that engineering roadmap um, to scale? And it takes a lot of work to get to um, compel us to be an investor in a particular company. But it's um, it's not theoretical; it's applied. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of success, I think, that um, we like to back. Okay, okay, great. Uh, Jeffrey, you're going to say quantum computing for now? <laughs> I am going to say quantum computing is the number one use case that we see from a commercial investor's perspective, because we understand it. But I will say a lot of the things that I've heard people talk about, dead reckoning, um, entangled sensors to be able to see a little bit more clearly out into, uh, into radar and stuff. Those are great, but those generally aren't things that, you know, I shop on eBay or Amazon and I watch TV and I, I want to make some money. That's different than um, some of those other applications. I, I do want to say this, though. Um, quantum computing is a tough business. And so Alibaba just announced this week that yeah, it's terminating right. its quantum lab. And I will say the first quantum computer we used in our firm was Alibaba with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. We flipped coins. And the fact that they're gone now just tells you how tough this business is. And so, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's tough not only for the startups and the companies that are working on it, but it's also tough for the investors because you really need to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> so, yes, my opinion. Um, Alex Challenge, in, the, in, in everybody that you're working with and providing business intelligence to in the space, what are you seeing in these four areas? Um. Oh, I'd probably take the answer in a bit of a different way. Um, the Any reason way you I got want to take it, it. anyway, I, I, like, I think we all need to recognize clearly that if we're going to invest in quantum, you've got to be diverse and around networking, sensing, et cetera. But the reason I get up in the morning and do this is because I'm pretty excited uh, to see in the next 10 years that we can compute things we'd never thought we'd be able to compute. That's what, like, like let's be really honest here. Why do we care? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Right, absolutely. Like, <laughs> don't pull what, me what, <laughs> why, why do we do this? Um, so what, what am I excited to see? Um, I think we all need to step back a bit. And and I, I benefit from the fact that I, I work across space tech and uh, climate tech, other industries. Right. And 
the, the big thing that you see is that we're in our echo chamber. This is a small, small, small market right now. That doesn't mean it's going to be small. It's going to be absolutely enormous if we can do the breakthroughs that we think we can. But I think we need to be understanding that we need to be quite ambitious with what we're building here. Understand big industrial logic. Properly look at what companies like AWS and Microsoft and Google are doing in this space as well. And really understand that this is not a purely... Uh, kind of company formation and startup game. This is a big government, big corporate game as well. And I think that's where what is often missed. And I'm focused on when are we going to have big breakthroughs in quantum computing that mean rather than worrying about like these questions around, oh, when are we going to get quantum advantage, all this kind of stuff, we're just stuck. We need to be getting to that stage of going, right, let's call it the chat GPT moment. I know it's a bit controversial that this is yeah. just such a no-brainer for enterprises, but you've got to be all over it. We don't have to persuade people anymore. People are coming to quantum computing companies, software companies, hardware companies, whatever it, the value chain ends up being, and needing this service immediately. Yeah, yeah, and I'm really glad you touched on that and, and, and the detail there. Because one of the things that I've seen is that, is that uh, you know, what's different than LIDAR, what's different than some of these other classic uh, private investor areas, the amount of government funding going in, and it's not slowing down, the amount of strategic funding by Fortune 500 companies is big, it's not slowing down, and we have the private investment. That fundamentally, because it's nation state and global change can happen if somebody gets this versus somebody doesn't, it's a bigger impact, right? So, okay, um, I wanna go to, okay. This one, uh, you know, I. <laughs> I actually saw Mark Danchek kind of talk about this on stage, I think at Q2B last year. I, I want to resurrect this in, in sort of a slightly different fashion and start with him first. What is the roadmap to success in quantum computing? How do you as a quantum computing company, you know, sort of at its best, what does this look like? And what I mean is sort of, you know, to, to reiterate what you had said, or at least what I remember what you had said is, hey, you know, uh, you and, you know, you did a round, you, you, you had a roadmap, you're coming back for more money and you hit your roadmap versus you didn't hit your roadmap. Maybe you don't remember saying this, but that's what I remember you saying, right? So, but what, what does that look like for you? When, you? when you invest in a company and they come back to the well and say, we need some more, um, you know, you're obviously looking at how successful customer engagement and all that, but what about them hitting their roadmap versus not hitting their roadmap? How do you look at that? What does that look like? Well, I mean, look, I think that's the fundamental bargain that investors make all the time. We're taking the risk that the company is going to execute on what they've said they're going to execute on. Um, there's a set of capital that's raised to hit a set of milestones that have yeah. a, that are a wide variety of things. Those are people. Those are technology. Those are co contracts. Those are um, engineering roadmaps. There's, you know... They're trying to clear hurdles on those things, right? And, and look, the reality is, is it's really hard to do this stuff. It doesn't matter whether it's quantum or, or space-based systems or any of those other things, right? It, it's not that you hit every hurdle. It's that you have executed to your best of your ability. You're demonstrating success and a, you know, a direction, really a vector, actually, um, that that you're moving in that you can see where the end game of these things are right and so in the companies that are you know that that we're investors in and and you know going to be investors in they are um, really focused on building so for quantum computing for example large-scale systems right like how and, and are you dealing with the complexities of that do you understand the power requirements? Do you understand the HPC systems you need for these things? Do you under, everyone's got qubits. It's everything that goes around the qubits that, that are the important things, right? So the reality is, is those are the types of things we're looking for. You know, do they have a error correction team? Do they have an algorithms team? Are they making novel, interesting strides in those particular areas? Are they partnered with other billion dollar companies who are building, helping them build these systems? What are the breakthroughs that they need to get to on those things? What are the hard engineering problems? How far have they moved? Um, is the hard engineering problems that they're focused on 
things that other people have done, whether it's in academia or other places. And it's, it's a matter of sort of tuning to get to those things. Um, so those is a, there's a wide variety of things that we're looking to do, but success is an incremental game in the, in the venture and startup world. Right. And, and we're not yeah. really focused on the startups as much um, where it's a bit harder. It's a bit more opaque how to do those things, but for the companies and the stages we're looking at, um, there, there's clear sort of targets and, and hurdles that, that we'd like to see them get to. And, and it's about moving towards those things and, and sort of the efficacy of getting there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Jeffrey. Yes, sir. Since you're all quantum computing, what's, what's, what's the roadmap look like for these companies that you're playing with? So everyone wants to get bigger. Bigger, more qubits. So like what Mark said, more, more qubits. You got to get the qubits right. And then you got to scale the control systems because you need qubits that all talk to each other and you need the ability to pull data, store it in memory, go back and, and do it again. And so I don't see a lot of longer term entanglements. Like uh, I don't see anyone solving the problem of having qubits entangled for a week, for a day. It's still very, very quick. And so these are very quick burst. So I'll tell you how, because I think about it as a uh, as a finance guy now, not so much as a as a physicist. How many stocks can I analyze? Right, and so I got to look at three thousand stocks, and I have to look at basically ten to the thousandth power of permutations and and options to come up with a best answer. And so most of the road mapping is. Maybe I can do 50 stocks. Maybe I can do 150 at a time. So it's tricky. I want to see 5,000 qubits or 10,000 or 100,000 or 400 million qubits. I want to see transistors. So right now we're still in the 50, 20, 2. So I would say the roadmap, we're way out on the roadmap. And so it's, a, it's just a bet on the future. It's a bet on talent. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I mean, I'll give you an insight. So uh, given we have the media business, every time we speak to a quantum CEO, they have the best technology, which is going to profoundly change the world. And I'm sure <laughs> well, this they is- they sort of have to commit to that, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, you know, we've learned, and I think the reality is, is people do genuinely have profoundly interesting technology. Um, but anyone who's honest around this is, understands that they're, they're making, you know, risk-based predictions about this stuff. What I can say is, uh, you know, we are seeing um, in comparison to other sectors where there's a lot of hype and hope, right? This is all gonna be ready in the next 10 years. What you see actually in the day-to-day -day is a consistent uh, delivery of roadmaps or technical milestones. So yes, I'm sure we'd all love right now to have, as Jeffrey said, a 5,000 logical qubit uh, computer to play around with so we can actually run proper uh, portfolio optimization algorithms or whatever it is, yeah? Right. Um, but we are seeing consistently, uh, you know, the journey to get there. You see it a couple of days ago, AWS uh, talking about logical qubits. You see uh, break breakthroughs that are coming, you know, I know that are coming down the pipeline and launching next month. There's gonna be very exciting breakthroughs continuously. Um, the most, the subtle point to kind of capture here, and I, and I say this with all due respect for those who are putting out roadmaps, but to be able to put out a roadmap and hit it implies that you have a pretty standard, you've got a clear vision to how you execute on your plan. That's both a good thing and a bad thing. So if you have, if you're kind of knowing you can, you know, keep building this incremental engineering, you can get some more qubits, or you may not be doing the more profound changes in technology, which we need to achieve fault tolerant quantum computing. So let's not get too tied to these roadmaps. They're helpful, they're instructive, and they're good to check how we've progressed, but they're not the only thing we need to be looking at to see the advancement of this technology. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you, George. Yeah, so I feel like um, there are 5,000 qubit systems out there, by the way, just to make a point, I think D-Wave has one, um, but every qubit is not the same as we know. 
But I think the problem with adoption, and you know, we this is a like the early days of the semiconductor business, where to embed a problem into a entangled qubit is a really hard thing to do, and the tools and the software layer to facilitate in the easy use and access of these platforms is very immature. And so one of the areas that I think the, the business has fallen down is to make this accessible and programmable to the unwashed masses, because the application uh, of problems into this space will probably be from unanticipated areas uh, to transform you know, certain things that we're doing today. And let's also remember that these quantum computers draw tiny bits of energy compared to their classical brethren. And so while they may be you know, on par with some of the problems like optimization or factoring, um, they can do it at a fraction of the energy consumption of the classical computer. So I think that one of the things holding this all back is the, is the software and user interface and ease of use layer. So think of the days when we built compilers and operating systems, the early days of Microsoft and DOS and all that stuff to those that remember. And I think that's what's needed to make this industry break out and these hit their milestones these companies have to make these products easier to use and open up, you know, the application space to see, you know, what can really be transformation. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Nardo. Yeah, I think uh, fr from my perspective, uh, if you take a look at uh, adoption from, you know, just following on what George was saying, the, the adoption piece of it from a business perspective or enterprise perspective is still lacking, right? So uh, what we normally see is enterprises uh, dabbling in a POC concept here and there, right? Uh, but, but the issue with that is they're only looking at it from a small slice of a potential indication of where quantum computing or anything in the quantum technology space uh, could be useful for, right? Uh, and and, and uh, let, let me give you an example in the quantum sensing space. You know, in, in the quantum sensing space, uh, especially for healthcare, if you if you created a quantum magnetometer for use for EEG, uh, all of a sudden you have a, you know th there's great uh, you have a lot of classical data coming in. You, you're you're doing diagnostics that you've never seen before. The, the, the issue is uh, the, the issue is it's not it's not the technology that's the issue. The issue is the translation of the data. The translation of that from a business use perspective, and that also takes a lot of time. So I think as we take a look at uh, the roadmap, we have to consider the roadmap from a business adoption and system transition perspective. So they know actually where, uh, how, uh, how they could go about making use of quantum technologies in an enterprise and they, they could understand it. Uh, a great example of that is Cleveland Clinic, right? So I know people are saying, oh, why did they have to buy an entire quantum computer? But guess what? They're trying to understand the impact uh, for their specific, uh, for their specific area, and, and I, I and I can guarantee you, they'll be the first in trying to figure that out. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nardo. Martin, last word. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I think the, uh, the the type of roadmap for quantum computing is as varied as the use case and the uh, and the technology. So you know, I've seen. There are companies that have a very holistic uh, roadmap where they grow and you know grow according to their advancements. Other ones decide, you know, we're going to hire 200 people right off the bat and, and go for it. And I've seen those two companies being somewhat, you know, roughly at the same place. Uh, so a little bit like uh, Jeffrey was mentioning earlier, right? You had the the lens of you know finance and portfolio optimization. Well, you can apply that lens to many other things and start. Uh, you know, being a quantum computing company that might want to focus on doing ASICs for material simulation or doing something specific. So you want to go for a full tolerant quantum computer? Yeah, that's that's a way to go. You want to go for very applied, very uh, specific uh, application? Yeah, that's another way to go. I don't think there's any uh, advantage to one or the other one. But the most important thing from an investor is to make sure that your entrepreneurs are comfortable with that roadmap. And I think this is something I've seen too often where the investors sort of force a roadmap on the entrepreneurs where they're way out of their comfort zone. And then, uh, you know, you take somebody who wants to take an holistic approach and it's like, no, 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 no. You go for a billion dollar company right off the bat, you hire 500 people. To that, that happens not only in quantum. <laughs> oh, oh I, I know. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I know. Um, so, yeah. so, uh, so, yeah. So, so I think that's... Uh, the, that's the point with the, the roadmap. There's not only one way there. There's not one end. Yeah. But I think yeah. something we need to focus a lot more is, right, we mentioned 5,000 qubits that are a very short lifetime and barely controllable is as useless as 
to fully control logical qubit. Okay, yeah. so resource estimation, I think it's it's a it's a place where we can put we need to put a lot of effort because it comes back to my first uh, to my comment earlier. If you have a five thousand uh, qubit fault tolerant, well, first of all, you don't even is it enough? And then uh, and then how much of fault tolerance you need to have? And then what is the resource you need to do for a specific problem? This is a very uh, unknown place, and if you want to build a useful, applicable quantum computers. We need to figure out those questions. It's like, how much really, like, what's the actual resources we're going to need at the end to get applicable value out of this? Yeah, still a lot of unknowns. All right, great. Thank you.